travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower as Jaime in Fuego. And if you please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on Hey to Stephen King. That's right, my favorite author, as you see from this uh, terrific tower of tomes behind me. What's up? Just call me Fuego, and welcome to the Horror Show. Uh, this is, uh, yes, as I said, hail to Stephen King, your weekly worship, and uh, I have been doing a little film series here for, uh, well, since uh, early last year, so for about a year now, as this is now the third year of uh, Hail to Stephen King that just started here for the year of 19, 2019. Uh, lots of cool King stuff coming. There is the Pet Cemetery remake, obviously. It Chapter 2, In the Tall Grass, maybe my most anticipated since we haven't seen that on the screen before. And we have a creep show television series. That is coming later this year. No definitive date yet, but there's filming that is about to start in Atlanta. They're already starting to line up writers and directors and say what stories we're going to be getting, which is really dope. Um, so far we know for sure Survivor Type is going to presumably be the first episode directed by Greg Nicotero from the uh, Skeleton Crew. That's right, that's right. But really there would be no Creepshow television series if not for the amazing original comic book and feature film that George Romero and Stephen King put together. King worked on this with Bernie Wrightson. My goodness, this is actually not the re-release, this is the original version of the comic, man, man, man. But this was just uh, recently uh, reissued, which is cool, so get the chance, go check it out. So, yeah, um, as far as ongoing coverage goes, though, what I was going to say is last year I started a series called Films That Forgot the Face of Their Father, and I'm going to get to the point here. So in 82, we got the great comic and feature film that was inspired by, you know, uh, all the EC comic stuff uh, that, you know, William Gaines did that basically got the comic industry in hot water, got the comic code put into place initially, and thankfully, you know, as times and trends changed in the 80s and stuff, and we got more mature comics coming from, you know, the likes of Alan Moore and various other creatives, it was like, okay, we are gonna just say screw it in certain circumstances, not everything is gonna have to abide by that we have the Marvel Knights line and the Max line and just all these different things over the years where even the big comic companies have been like, no, we're not always going to just make this stuff for kids and for all ages. We're going to make it more mature. But the EC comic stuff like Tales from the Crypt, like uh, The Haunts of Fear and The Vault of Horror and stuff like that was really what laid the groundwork in the inspiration for Creep Show. It was basically Ramiro and King's collaborative love letter to that that era of storytelling and the twist ending and the schlocky nastiness and it was definitely i mean we eventually got stuff like the twilight zone and you know uh the outer limits which was more on the sophisticated side i guess when it came to the horror not always i mean pig nose people for god's sake but i mean a, a lot of the time it was and so creep show comes out 1982 performs decently i don't think it was like an insane runaway hit if i recall box office or anything like that but obviously big cult following 89 comes the, uh, 88 or 89, boy, the exact date, but before the decade was over, we get Creepshow 2. Uh, not quite as good, although it does house my favorite uh, installment, story-wise, of all of the Creepshow tales. I mean, the crate is really good, and, you know, you hold your breath for a really long time, really cool, too, uh, with, with Danson and Nielsen and so on, but... Uh, the Raft is personally my favorite of all of the Creepshow segments and stuff. And so that's in Creepshow 2. Um, the one about, you know, this hair is going to get me paid and get me laid and blah, blah, blah. Pretty, pretty terrible. And then the one about the hitcher is, um, or the hitchhiker, who's just, that's a ratly, that's a ratly. Um, who knows, I should really do a proper Creepshow 2 review since I have for Creepshow 1 and never did for Creepshow 2. I try to make these correspond with anniversaries, but... Getting to the point, meandering fuego man, is that Films That Forgot the Face of Their Father is a series that has entailed me covering 
sequels that King and original, like, creative people, perhaps behind the original films and stuff like that, had nothing to do with. But most namely, it's people playing in King's playground with really little to no involvement of his whatsoever. And the funny thing is, I thought that I was going to be trashing on all of these films in this series of coverage, whether it was Return to Salem's Lot, whether it was Pet Cemetery 2, whether it was The Rage Carry 2, uh, even the even the Sometimes They Come Back Again, I think Sometimes They Come Back Again was the second one. Sometimes They Come Back for More was pretty, pretty flippin' terrible, man. But for the most part, I have not hated these films like I thought I was going to. And as a kid, I think I really did because of the fact that I saw the shift in tone, I saw the difference in quality, but I don't know, working on a horror show and us doing two, sometimes three episodes a day for next month in February starting our sixth season, you watch a lot of low budget, silly, crappy stuff and, uh, and, and also as time goes by maybe you start to realize some of the original adaptations of the King stuff weren't as good. No, I mean, we know what the cream of the crop is. We know about pretty much anything Darabont does and, you know, stuff like Misery and anything Rob Reiner does, and the original Pet Cemetery, and, you know, uh, for my money, the original It and, uh, and The Stand, and, you know, uh, even The Shining, if uh, Kubrick did something completely different, that's in some ways a film that did forget the face of its father, but was great for what it was. So, the, the point that I'm trying to get to is that I thought that I was just going to be launching the, like, Angry Joe hate parade, whatever type of silliness on all of those films that I just mentioned, didn't happen until now. 2006 brought us a little film, and little because of the fact that there's little to no budget for the predominance of this film, called Creep Show 3. I've never watched Creep Show 3 before until today, and it's it's funny because I'm thinking I'm gonna do another video about uh, you know just favorite anthology segments and stuff like that. I was just thinking about this like my most wanted adaptations and, and whatnot, but so. Watch Creepshow 3 today. And uh, Creepshow 3 is hands down 100% the worst thing with a title associated with Stephen King anything that I have ever, ever watched. My God, is this film absolute trash. And not that endearing street trash type trash or you know for for my money I love a lot of full moon I love a lot of trauma I can get behind schlock when it is when it's so bad that it's good you know when there is some sort of just amusing endearing factor to the crappiness I mean I don't know there's this is so bad this is so so very bad. I'm honestly more so curious than anything else about how they got the creep show name and license. I mean, I would imagine some of this, but for that reason, uh, it's it's really the same reason why a lot of people are like, why would King give an endorsement to something like the Miss Television series? Why? I mean, you know, why would he say the Dark Tower movie is good? Well, I guess at the end of the day, the Almighty Dollar really does prevail in some fashion. So in 2006, we get Creep Show three donuts to do from. Ramiro or from Ma, uh, from Psy King, from El Rey himself, and it's still an anthology, but the weird thing about the way that they approach this anthology, besides the fact that it's very low budge with the occasional, very deliberately over the top gore that, you know, I'll, I'll get to it because there's, there's two bits in particular in this where the gore is actually, the gore practical is decent and not too terrible, but it's really, it's the horrible stories that are here to tell that are especially bad. So you have the framing device once again of, you know, like a, a, a creep, you know, creeper, crypt keeper-esque storyteller of sorts. But whereas you had some live action flavor in the second one, and then you had the great, uh, you know, uh, hand-drawn animation stuff in the first one, they, they tried to go to an animated thing for the, the book ending, you know, uh, opening and then closing, but it is seriously, like some of the worst computer like moving like stop motion almost animation but it looks like it was made by like uh, a art uh, i don't know an introductory art school student you know just the way stuff is just kind of moving along almost like south park style but with no detail and just everything looking absolutely terrible there's this bit with this dog getting turned into hot dogs at the very beginning and that this is where it's 
for whatever reason, they took the Pulp Fiction approach with this, you know, the, 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 the Tarantino, because he does the same thing with, with Reservoir Dogs and is about to with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, presumably. Um, also done to very interesting effect in two movies this past year that I loved, one being Bad Times at the El Royale and another being Low Life. I have always enjoyed when that sort of, you know, 90s-ish approach, which was at least where that form of, uh, that framing device for storytelling became really popular. Tarantino was definitely not the first person to do that, but he popularized it in independent cinema and then later on into, uh, you know, shifting into the mainstream as so many of these indie directors like, you know, Tarantino and Rob Rodriguez and Kevin Smith and various others did in the 90s. So for whatever reason, this tries to do like the interlocking story sort of thing and you have five different tales and so characters from one story show up in other stories and so it's not like there's like a whole overarching type thing but there's plot threads that jump from one story to another story to another story and so yeah it's um it's handled very amateurishly and the tone of this is like it's trying to go for that creep show fat like the, the one thing about Creepshow is you had stuff that was just really over the top, like the Hitchhiker from part two that I mentioned, and then you've also got the stuff where it was, I don't know, the, the on-the-nose stuff about the, uh, the wooden Indian guys uh, and the humor just falling flat like in that one is more so what they end up getting from the five tales in this, but it's, it's way beyond that as fun, like, that feels like, like, like seriously, the Wooden Indian segment from Creepshow 2 feels like Shakespearean frickin' theater compared to the type of humor that they're going for in this. And there, it's, I don't really think they have any likable characters throughout this, and that's obviously and deliberately the point. Uh, for, first and foremost, our first tale is about this, this snivelly little, uh, she's like going around in a Catholic schoolgirl outfit type of girl who, you know, she's presumably anorexic, the grandmother for whatever reason, and this is a joke that they come back to over and over and over. She gets home from school and she's like just talking like a little bees notch with her friend on the phone, gets home, does, she's being rude to her family and everything, the grandmother is making fun of her for having no ass. And she's like, no, you have to have an ass. And it's a joke. They beat like a red-headed dead horse in various languages and vernaculars throughout the... Because basically, the what this little stupid story is about is that you have the father, you know, her father, and uh, he pops up in like another story because you find out he's a detective. But he's bumbling Papa Bear at home, and he has bought this remote, a universal remote, can you think you know where this is going? From a homeless guy, and he's trying, and apparently all kinds of characters in this go to this certain homeless guy to get electronics, for whatever reason, and so when he starts messing with the universal remote, it starts transporting our, our little bees Nietzsche, Alice, from like different iterations of her reality, so uh, the, ch the channel changer goes then, you know, changed once and suddenly her whole family is African-American and then her next, uh, the next switch, they're all Hispanic and, you know, talking in Espanol way and it's just, it's tropey and stupid and so poorly executed. The only interesting thing about this segment is as she's getting sent from like dimension to dimension, from like 20 verse to 20 verse of sorts, and yet yeah, th this film was not even thinking that far ahead of itself or trying to incorporate that, but her body does start to degrade and it's, uh, I don't know, she starts near the end of it, this is some of the only decent practical in this, is like her body gets these bubbly blisters and skin. It's almost like when dude gets uh, melted with the acid in Robocop before he gets run over and stuff. That's basically the way this bitch is looking by the end of it. And, uh, but then you find, like, you find out their neighbor, who is this professor who works at the college, is like, kind of sinister, and he's the one behind the remote, and he's the one selling them to the homeless guy, and it's just, it's stupid, and uh, that's really all that. This maybe is worth watching just for the sheer amusement of how ridiculous it is. Like, there needs to be a Creepshow 3 drinking game or something, because, it's, man, when humor falls flat, when, I mean, maybe I'll try to put that together at some particular point. So, uh, you, you get to the second story, and this is the one where it goes for a little less humor, and it's just as dumb, if not worse, because at least the, at least the chick being, you know, just a little bees and stuff, and just, you know, a t totally deplorable person, 
that has some sort of charm and then when she's like turning into this mutated slug looking you know degrading body type thing with bursting blisters and you know radiation and so on and so forth at least that's kind of kind of interesting but the second story is about this security guard who lives in this rundown apartment and he has a neighbor who's a drug dealer and a pimp and there's all these different whores coming to and fro and so on and so forth and uh he basically, from this same homeless guy who at one point sold the remote to Papa Bear in the last story, yeah, he buys a, like, transistor radio in the late 2000s, buying a transistor radio from a homeless guy because that's your only, that's the only entertainment option you can afford or whatever. Yeah, and the radio starts talking to him in this sultry, almost like phone sex operator voice. We have to do this, Jerry. Don't put the mayonnaise on your sandwich, Jerry, because it's it always gives you a tummy ache. Like, the dialogue in this movie is mind-blowingly bad. And, you know, as I'm even doing this review, it's almost so stupidly, horrendously horrible that I am laughing at some of the inherent idiocy of it, but, so the radio starts telling him what to do, tells him to go start robbing and killing and doing all kinds of silliness. And that's basically, that's, that's all that we have in, in this story. Oof. So then you go to story three, and story three is about how there's a killer call girl on the loose. And killer call girl is based in the same apartment complex and presumably works for the same pimp. And then that uh, she gets on a call to this really nice ritzy house and you know she shows up to to get down and you know you're like is she the killer is she not so on and so forth and there's something weird about the guy who she's been called for um this is really what well, i mean i guess you can really see the twist coming a mile away with most of these but you could see the twist coming from like psh, I mean, I guess they hint at it, so to speak, but you could see it from like, from a football field away. If not, then, I mean, from, from, you know, to just get your 10 yards and get a first down for God's sake, and you, you can see what's gonna be happening here. So, um, yeah, this is another one where they, unlike, unlike in story one about, uh, about Alice the Bees, um, story two, not really having much as far as gore and stuff like that goes, but you know, this one tries to get the blood going on again, and it fails miserably in my estimation and it's just and the the practical makeup on one character in particular uh near the back half of this uh, once we do get some gore and some stuff going on um looks really bad and it has like a little combination of some cg going down too once again at any time as opposed to using buckets of blood and stuff like that which only happens like a couple instances in this story Anytime anything digital, whether it's that shite animation at the beginning that I mentioned, or if it's, uh, you know, if it's little digi enhancements here and there, including one character's face melting, like at the very end of the movie, oh my lord, is it bad. So anytime there is CG of any kind in this movie, it's awful. The practical, not terrible though. Uh, so story four goes into, you know, that weird professor guy that has been, you know, uh, funneling weird remotes and technology to strange homeless man. Well, now we get his little story and his story is about the fact that they used to play pranks on two of his favorite students back in the day. And he has invited them over to his house for drinks and dinner because he is about to get married. And uh, yeah, they are very suspicious about some things about his wife. And this is another one where... Well, with all of them, you pretty much see what is coming, you know, less than a mile away, as I was just joking about. Although this one, once we actually get into what happens with these guys, um, I'll just say it gets bloody. And this was one of the only parts, along with in the first segment, where Alice is like, you know, where her body is degrading and everything, where I was like, yeah, that was actually enjoyable gore and just kind of captured the over-the-top, silly, disgusting tone, like with, uh, you know, with The Raft, which, you know, not being a story that was played for laughs at all, or, you know, The Hitchhiker in part two, where he just keeps getting run over, and, you know, he's just, there's less and less and less left of him each time. I, I would honestly contend that I think Creepshow 2 is a lot gorier than Creepshow 1, although not directed by by Ramiro, just produced, and then, you know, King scripting and stuff. But, um, yeah, so st stories one and four are really the only ones that have a decent, like, 
gore that I can say, okay, at least you did something right there. And uh, some special effects guy who worked on Spielberg's War of the Worlds was the main guy behind at least the practical. I don't know about the, I don't know about the digital when we see it, but that was trash, as I said. So I can't really spoil too much about that without. Um, you know, divulging more than I would like to. So let's jump into the fifth and final story, which is about uh, basically a total schmuck of a physician who has some sort of court ordered thing where he's working in a free clinic and he is a slimer as slimer gets. Like, I mean, he's like chugging ecto, uh, ecto cooler. He's this bad. And, uh, yeah, he's like trying to get the hotties that are coming through the clinic. You know, this chick's like, yeah, my, my wrist is hurting. And he's like, okay, take off your clothes and let me examine you. Like, and in, in hindsight, it's so terribly trashily stupid. I, I almost feel like I'm making you guys think this is more of a worthwhile watch as I'm laughing. But I'm just laughing at the ridiculousness of this movie. Um, but the... the the otherworldly essence of this that happens, it ties in with the dog getting killed at the very beginning and how uh, basically somebody has turned dog into hot dogs. And so crazy doctor buys hot dog, doesn't realize hot dog is made of what it actually is, drops it on the ground, gives it to homeless panhandler who's trying to bump some money from him or ask for food or whatever. Dude eats hot dog, dies, and then just starts tormenting him and you see a couple other characters you see one character from the story with the professor you see the professor himself in here you see i mean so they're they're really trying to show that there is this very small contained universe but um yeah at the end of the day the fact that most of the acting is on on par with just the worst I've ever seen on screen. There's people either overacting and, you know, the stupid silliness of everything, or there's just like the most wooden dialogue ever and you're like, does this, has this person ever been in a feature film before? You know, and so that's uneven and that's bad. So uh, yeah, if I'm just gonna sum all of this up, overall impressions like we always do on the horror show, this is like as one star as one star gets and maybe the only way that you could watch it is if you were like under the influence of something i don't know whatever your cup of tea is or if you're just you know sitting there uh you know just munching out and just laughing with your buddies whatever um so yeah awful storytelling uh very by the books nothing original being done from the structuring to the very similar stories of you know Tech, just technology, you know, taking control or just having minds of its own or, you know, whatever. You've got to, you've got every trope imaginable from, you know, mad professor of sorts to, you know, uh, to, you know, snotty, uh, you know, uh, high school girl to, I mean, it, you name it, man. Just about everything as far as just cliche after cliche that you could contemplate is on display here. Um, the music is really, really, really bad too. It's going for like this goof to derp kind of vibe. And you know, there's just like a wah wah type vibe to so much of the score and weird cued sound effects trying to make things feel as goofy, if not goofier than they actually are. So they were really trying to nail home that point that this movie is stupid. We realize we're trying to be stupid. And maybe they were thinking that that would somehow excuse the finished product, I don't know, but one of the few things that I will say is that the the practical a couple times, story one and story four, was actually like satisfying, but aside from that, this is the epitome of what I was anticipating when I began the series films that forgot the face of their father here on Hail to Stephen King. Uh, there's only a couple, there's only a couple left and they're all gonna be series that uh, Marsha or Cecil or both of them want to be a part of covering so we're gonna do all of the Children of the Corn sequels because there's a ton of them it's the most sequelized of everything Stephen King has done and then we're gonna do the Mangler and the Mangler Reborn I believe yeah yeah so there's there's two Mangler sequels I don't know if Reborn is a prequel or what I've actually never seen Mangler 2 or 3 so I I can't gauge how good or bad but I've seen most of the Children of the Corn sequels um, I don't think I've seen Genesis, which I know is like kind of a reboot, but yeah, guys. So beyond that, there are three different uh, Indian remakes from the country of India that I'm going to be doing at some particular time in the near future. There is something called um, 
Uh, no Smoking, which is a remake of Quitters Incorporated, which we saw previously in the Cat's Eye. And I believe it's in Night Shift, if I recall correctly. And then there is also, um, it's called, it's called Wo, or Wa. I, I'm not sure what the proper uh, Indian pronunciation would be, but W-O-H. And it is a Indian television series, which is apparently like kind of on the soap opera dramatic side of things, but it's actually a remake of Stephen King's It. Yeah, I watched some footage and some weird trailers. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to track down all these episodes, but especially with Chapter 2 coming in September of this year, I got to track this down. I plan on rereading it this year as well, just like I'll probably end up rereading the Dark Tower books being the year of 19 and everything. I was just thinking about that the other day. What I really want to track down is Stephen King read The Gunslinger himself. I'm not sure if he did, uh, if he did Wastelands or if he did Drawing or any of the other ones, but yeah, back when, uh, back when the audiobook stuff was first becoming popularized, I, I've been looking in the secondhand stores and seeing these cassette releases of stuff, cassette and occasionally CD, of stuff that just was never made digital, I'm guessing, and thrown on the audibles and the audiobooks and places like that. So, but hey, anyway, I digress. So, wa, uh, no smoking, and then there is also, uh, boy, the name is totally eluding me, but once again, another remake from the country of India, and it's a remake of Misery. So yeah, aside from the Mangla films and the Children of the Corn films, I just have those uh, remakes from the country of India, and then we will have done everything films that forgot the face of their father, pretty much. And uh, I've been told that The Dead Zone is actually a pretty good TV series. I'm gonna check that at some point. Check that out at some point this year. Probably handle those season by season. Uh, also planning some reviews of Haven. Uh, boy, there's a lot of fun stuff coming here in the year of 19. So. I gotta extend a grande gracias to everybody who was tuned into this segment. Have you seen Creepshow 3? My God! Uh, if you have, I really, really want your thoughts. And honestly, even if you haven't, uh, I found it on YouTube. <laughs> it wasn't like the best quality. It was a little on the grainy side. But uh, if you, do I told myself while I was watching this that I would never, ever buy it even though I would buy Return to Salem's Lot, even though I have bought Pet Cemetery 2, I've bought The Rage Carry 2 and some of those. Uh, I feel like as a completist, I almost, if I can find this cheap enough, I need to get it. I know it was released somehow, some way by Anchor Bay in the UK. I know there's like a German special edition. I, I guess there's an uncut edition too. I don't know where some gore or whatever would have been trimmed, maybe in those two segments that I mentioned, but as I've done this review, I almost feel like I need to have it because if I was having like a party with friends over, I would want to throw this film on just for the sheer amusement of how horrible it is because it does not deserve the creep show name, damn it. Uh, but yeah, that is neither here nor there. So I have been Jaime and Fuego. You can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as of this week, starting my On the Road to the Oscars coverage. We have eight feature films that were nominated for Best Picture and a slew of others that have acting and directing and you know different accolades that they will be vying for. So on Infuegotainment, which is my personal YouTube channel, you will be able to find all of my coverage, reviews of those Best Picture nominations and various other things, as well as starting some coverage on Infuegotainment for every Star Wars film leading up to the release of Episode 9 this December. It's funny because it was something I was thinking about doing a couple months ago, and uh, then as I was trying to think, I'm like, well, would it be cool to do it on the 4th, the 14th, or the 24th of every month, leading all the way up to, you know, even like, do hell, let's do like the, the Ewok movies, and let's do uh, the animated Clone Wars film and stuff like that, as well as, you know, Rogue One and Solo and stuff like that. And then I saw a fellow YouTuber is already doing it. So I guess the idea is out there in the public consciousness, but whatever. On the 24th, you will see my review of The Phantom Menace coming out. And on the 24th of each month, on my separate channel, Infoigotainment, you will be able to see me reviewing Star Warsy. So that'll be fun. But more importantly than anything is the fact that here on The Horror Show, we want you to like, share, subscribe, 
and uh, hit the bell here on the page so that anytime we're putting up a new video, uh, as of at least through the end of this month, it's still gonna be two, in certain cases, three episodes a day, but as we start our sixth season in the month of February, yes, it is going to be, uh, it's gonna be scaled back a little bit and divided a little more between the horror show uh, Patreon and then here on the main channel. But yeah, Hail to Stephen King is not going anywhere. That is still gonna be cranking out. And so yes, uh, stay here with us and uh, make sure that you hit all of that stuff so that you get all of those notes anytime new freshness is coming at you. So that's it for me guys. And uh, I guess until the wheel of Ka comes around once more, I say hasta luego sin amigos and constant readers and viewers alike say thank you. I hope that we get to share more palavras sooner rather than later. And until that instance occurs, remember, stay scared. And in this case, read Stephen King Creep Show. You can track down a copy of it, but I don't know. If you want to see something horrendously bad, check out Creep Show 3.